It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 102, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Shiloh Avery and Jason Rorig own and operate Tumbling Shoals Farm in northwestern North Carolina. With three acres tilled and almost a half an acre under plastic, they gross about $145,000 selling certified organic vegetables through a CSA, three farmer's markets, a cooperative CSA, and a few restaurants. Shiloh and Jason were very intentional about where they chose to start Tumbling Shoals Farm and the smaller cities that they chose to market in. They share the factors behind locating in northwestern North Carolina, the advantages of marketing in smaller markets, and how their marketing decisions have shaped their production strategies. Jason and Shiloh tell us about the ways they've made use of high tunnels and hay grove polytunnels to increase the reliability of their cropping systems. We also dig into the lessons that Shiloh and Jason have learned about the power of having enough labor to leave them time to manage the farm, and the changes they are making based on some in-depth business planning as they move into their tenth season on the farm. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. And by Farm Commons. Strong, resilient, sustainable farm businesses are built on a solid legal foundation. Farm Commons provides practical legal resources to help farmers understand and respond to how the law affects them. Free guides and tutorials available online at farmcommons.org. And by Small Farm Central, providers of Member Assembler CSA management software. Member Assembler has the flexibility to serve the needs of the myriad of farmers' business models, as well as serving non-traditional local food subscriptions like meat, fish, dairy, and fruit CSAs and CSFs. Smallfarmcentral.com. Jason Rorig and Shiloh Avery, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having us. We are we are honored to be here. Really appreciate your making time. This is going to be the this is the last interview of 2016, even though we won't go live until the the middle of January with this show. So thank you for ending it on a nice note. I really appreciate that. I'd like to start off by having you guys tell us about Tumbling Shoals Farm, where you guys are located, how many acres you're farming, where and how you're marketing your produce. So we're in uh, northwestern North Carolina in a a little tiny rural community. Um, the closest larger town would be Boone, North Carolina, which is a home of uh, Appalachian State University. Um, we the whole entire property is only 15 acres, and we're farming on uh, actual tilled ground, slightly less than three acres. Um, markets, we have a, a 90 member, this is where we were last year. We have a 90 member CSA, um, where we actually pack the boxes and distribute them to distribution points. That's roughly about 25% of our sales, 25 to 30%. We sell at three farmers markets a week, uh, and that's about 60%, 60 to 65% of our sales. We participate in a cooperative multi-farm CSA, um, which uh, was just about 5% uh, this past year. And then we do a tiny bit of wholesale, which adds up to about another 5%, and that's mostly to restaurants. Um, uh, we are entering our 10th season, so this is a big uh, season of transition for us, about big decisions. We've been spending a bunch of time in in business meetings, I like to tell people corporate, we've been in corporate meetings um, talking about uh, and planning where we're going to go in the next five years. For some reason, 10 years is a, is a big number. It's a, it's a milestone. Uh, and, and just a little bit more about the farm. We are a certified organic vegetable operation. We grow about 40 different crops and then a, a number of varieties of each of those crops. Uh, we've got six, 30 by 66 foot, which I know is an odd size, poop houses, and uh, a hay grove high tunnel that we, uh, it's 90 by 100 that we, uh, it's the multi-bay hay grove high tunnel that we move around the farm to grow tomatoes under. Uh, we've got six row, 200 foot rows of berries, uh, blackberries and blueberries but we are primarily vegetables. We've got just a couple rows of sunflowers. We, we started as uh, an operation thinking we were going to be about 50-50 flower and vegetable production, but now we are almost entirely vegetable and fruit production. Just to seize on, on that little detail, and then we'll kind of work our way out from there. 
why was that? I mean, it, I, I feel like we've talked to a lot of cut flower growers who said, you know, oh, we started off as vegetable growers and we ended up being cut flower uh, growers. You guys kind of went in the opposite direction. Uh, yeah, it's mostly a market. It's market driven. Um, so we, uh, Alex and Betsy hit, you interviewed Alex on the podcast. Um, I worked for Alex in two, I don't know, 15 years ago, whatever it was, 2003, I think, or 2004. Um but uh, and we were kind of modeling our operation after theirs. But what we discovered, and uh, we discovered it rather painfully, because the big holy grail for cut flower growers is to have a good amount of cut flowers on Mother's Day. And we had beautiful flowers on Mother's Day, and we took them all to market, and we took them all back home with us because we're in a in a market where. We like to say people don't have mothers, <laughs> but they're, uh, it's a college town. And so people have moved there and their mothers are not necessarily there. Um, and so uh, our flower market is really, um, really pretty small in this area. Um, and so it's really market driven. Um, I, I got to be honest, uh, I'm a very social person. And for some reason, the flowers fell mostly to me. And so I found myself doing. Uh, flower stuff off by myself and I would hear the crew over on the other side of the farm laughing and uh, I didn't like that very much. <laughs> there was also a, a, a personality motivation. Um, we also really like to eat. So food tends to be um, where we can really thrive in a marketing situation because we can talk about um how we prepare it and um, where as far as are interesting and, and really challenging and pretty, uh, we just don't have that same passion. So it's both market and personality, but honestly, it was really mostly market. And I'm curious when you talk about markets, uh, you said your primary market is in Boone, North Carolina, which is, um, I just Google mapped it, is 46 minutes from your farm kind of heading off to the west. You've also got Winston-Salem. Uh, about an hour and 15 minutes to the east of you. Why have you guys decided to market in Boone? That started with a market survey that Shiloh did back when she was a student at Central Carolina Community College's Sustainable Agriculture Program. And why Shiloh chose Boone, uh, I think it's just because we liked it. It's a, it's a pretty town. It's a uh, nice landscape. It's close to great recreation. So we were interested in being close to that community. And it had, at the time before we moved here, a farmer's market that, that really needed an operation like ours. So we, we saw an opportunity there and we jumped in. Winston-Salem, since that time, has developed a pretty good farmer's market. But it, at the time that we were looking 10 or 12 years ago, uh, it, it really didn't have uh, much of a farmer's market and had a reputation for uh, small farms going there and not not having the success that they, they should. And I, I think they've really turned that around. The local food movement has hit Winston-Salem uh, since that time, and there are opportunities there, and we're actually considering it at this point, doing some marketing in Winston-Salem. But uh, at the time, Boom was was the better option for us. So we chose uh, Hickory, which is equal distance from our farm as we where we ended up um, as our secondary market. It's a town of about what would I say forty five thousand, um, and at where we were initially looking for land was in two counties and and. Uh, between Boone and Hickory. And so it actually, as a secondary market, was really close to our target area. And where we ended up finding land eventually is actually an hour and 15 minute drive to Hickory, which is the same to Winston-Salem. Um, but we have been going to this Hickory market and as it developed um, for the entire time we've been growing. So we're entering our 10th season at that market as well. And so that has really developed into uh, a rapidly growing into our primary market. It's, it's not there yet, but um, it's rapidly growing. So it's not a, a as we look toward Winston-Salem for expansion, it's not a, a substitute for Hickory as our secondary market. No, and we're only an hour and a half from Charlotte, which is a city of a million people. 
And it, it kind of had some of the same characteristics as Winston-Salem when we were shopping for markets uh, in that it, it just didn't really have a well-developed farmer's market. And we didn't feel like we were in a position to create such a thing. So settling on the Boone and, and Hickory markets really was a decision about how good the farmer's markets were at the time and, and the potential that we saw there for them. It was also the in Boone, um, we it, it's uh, so we're in a we're a zone seven farm here, and Boone I think uh, is a zone six in that area. It's very, it's it, it, we go up a mountain um, to get to Boone, and so when we were doing our market survey ten years ago or twelve years ago, we looked at that and and we saw a a niche opening for us to come in with early produce just by being off down off the mountain. So we're in the foothills. We're a full uh, zone warmer. And so we could see easily us coming in and filling a niche early and, and late. It's also, um, we looked at that market and a lot of growers sell bedding plants as part of their operation. Um, but that was all the growers had there early. And so we didn't, we didn't pursue bedding plants as uh, part of our operation because that wasn't the niche. The niche for us was coming in there early with uh, fresh produce and then maybe being there a little bit late with fresh produce. Um, that's specific to Boone because it's a, a whole climate zone colder. We are at 1,300 feet and uh, Boone is 3,300 feet. So we've got that full 10, 10 or 11 degrees of climate advantage being here uh, only 45 minutes away. Uh, which which has proved to be uh, a big deal for us. But, of course, it's an arms race. As the we came in with earlier produce, the, the farmers in that neighborhood uh, saw the advantage to investing in season extension. And so, you know, everybody's doing that to get earlier and earlier produce there. It's really interesting to me when you talk about uh the the market planning that you did and kind of targeting where you wanted to be growing and and where you wanted to be selling before you had a piece of land it sounds like can you talk a little bit about that planning process that you went through ten or twelve years ago yeah yeah I I like to say that we were lucky in that we were born landless and without any money so uh, you know some farms in, some farmers inherit their land and. And then that's where they are. That's that's where they're farming. But we didn't we didn't have such limitations. Uh, we were uh, when we left the Peace Corps, we had a a uh, five thousand dollars in a Pontiac Grand Prix with uh, one hundred twenty five thousand miles on it, where the transmission went at one hundred twenty eight thousand miles. So uh, it it didn't last very long as an asset. But the the ability to, to shop for your market was uh, that was our primary thing that we made a decision about is, is shopping for the market. It wasn't only market because honestly, if it were only market, we would probably have landed in uh, D.C. or something like that, but um, or New York. But I went to school in Kentucky and fell in love with Southern Appalachia. And so my search for uh, a place to land after Peace Corps definitely involved Southern Appalachia. So I def I looked um, in Georgia and South Carolina and Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, and then through a friend of a friend, I received a brochure snail mail while I was in Peace Corps for this sustainable farming program at Central Carolina Community College in uh, Pittsburgh, North Carolina, which is actually um, a little further east. It's not quite in the, it's in the Piedmont of North Carolina near Chapel Hill in, in Raleigh. Um, and got excited about actually taking some community college courses in sustainable farming. Um, and so we landed in North Carolina for that reason with our eye always further west. Um, but Asheville is a bigger market, not by a lot, but by some. Um, and so we were really looking southern Appalachia. We looked uh, in uh, Roanoke, Virginia, and Black, uh, Blacksburg, Virginia, and we looked at Chattanooga, Tennessee, and then we looked at Boone and Asheville, and, and really kind of those regions 
uh, and where their markets were and um, at the time and where we could see them potentially going. So there was a lot of projection there. And we saw the Boone market at the time. It was it was an established market. Um, it's now some 30 five years old, I think. Um, but it was, uh, it didn't have any early growers. We saw potential for that market to grow, but for us to get in as new growers, small growers, and then kind of grow with the market. And that has actually proven to be true with uh, Hickory as well. But uh, we honestly were focused a lot more on Boone at the time. Hickory was just sort of a secondary thing um, that's, that's evolved in our thinking quite a bit, but, uh, but yeah, we, we, so we were easy to get in at that time where Asheville was a much more, I want to say flooded or saturated market. They didn't have a, we are strong believers in a centralized farmer's market, um, rather than where people can make a living at a farmer's market, um, which we have seen in Carborough, North Carolina, where Alex Hitt sells, um, and even Durham, North Carolina, um, where there's centralized markets where, you know, people are coming to grocery shop. The customers are coming to grocery shop rather than pick up a bunch of radishes. And in Asheville, there were, there, that didn't exist. Um, there were lots of little tiny markets, you know, where customers are coming to pick up a bunch of radishes or, a, you know, some hamburger or whatever, but not actually doing their grocery shopping. And so people weren't really making livings at those markets unless you went to all of them. And that didn't yeah. appeal to us. So, so we actually traveled around to all those uh, to farmers markets and all those communities, and people were very generous with information. Where they would, after talking to us for a little bit and finding out our interest and uh, realizing that that we were serious, uh, they would give us numbers. They would tell us how much they were making at farmers market, and so we were we were really grateful for that. But that that was helpful in making the decisions. And when we were Writing the business plan, we were actually selling at the, the Durham Farmers Market. And in terms of customer counts and, and vendor counts, the uh, the Farmers Market in Boone, the Watauga County Farmers Market, was uh, comparable. So we could look at our sales for a day in Durham and uh, easily translate that to, to what we might be able to accomplish in Boone. Now, Durham's a much larger community and has, has since that time grown at a more rapid pace, but also there's a lot more competition from growers there. So you just said something really interesting. I mean, you talked about customer count even, and I don't know very many farmers who keep track of, of those kinds of details in marketing. Is that something that you guys are still tracking or is that something that you were mostly doing when you were in this market research phase? No, we're still doing that. Uh, in fact, we're both on the boards of uh, our respective markets. I I sell at the Watauga County, the Boone Farmers Market, with an employee every week. And then Shiloh has been going to the Hickory Farmers Market. Uh, and in Watauga, we actually make it a, a job of the market manager to estimate. We get we get estimates of customers because it's really difficult to actually do crowd counting uh, when you get down to it. But we, we can know what the traffic flow is through the market roughly every week. And then we continue to, to try to figure out what percentage of those customers we're actually selling to. So the easiest way for us right now is to estimate a median sale and then divide our total sales by that to get to get a best guess as to what our customer counts are for a day. We don't actually have a clicker there that we're counting, but we are trying to figure out uh, how many how many customers we actually have. And and that way, if we know how many customers we have, we can uh, figure out how to better increase our income by serving those customers or evaluate whether we need to. Uh, look at reasons why we aren't picking in more customers. So on a, on a busy August day in Watauga, there are more than 2,000 customers who go through the market, but only 300 or 350 of them are shopping with Tumbling Shoals Farm. And so uh, we spend a lot of time thinking about why that is. 
uh, I was at a, a great conference a few years ago, the National Young Farmers Conference, and they had some uh, folks from the, the green market in New York City there who did market analysis for vendors in the green market. And they had people, uh, I think it was four people, stand outside their booth. And one person would count the number of people who walked by just with a clicker. And a second person would count the number of people who looked at the booth. Uh, again, a third person would count the number of people who looked at the booth and then walked in and actually browsed. And uh, the, the last person was counting the number of people who actually made purchases. And then they had strategies, which they, they shared a few at the conference, of how to, to each of those steps. If you have a lot of people looking by but not looking, you need to need to do some things with your signage. If you have a lot of people looking but not coming in, then there's some display things that you can do. And if people are coming in but not making the final purchase, well, they had a list of, of things that you could do to actually get people to make that final purchase. So uh, that's why we find the customer count to be useful is so that we can make decisions about where in our, in our display and marketing that that we can make improvements. This is a, a lot of the. I, Jason talks about the 2,000 people coming through market on a, on a busy August day. Um, farmers in large market areas are always horrified by our farmers market numbers, um, and this is you know we we chose a relatively small market area and um, can can definitely see the wisdom of. Uh, being in a larger market, I was visiting a farmer in the D.C. area uh, last year, and he was like in his third or fourth year of farming, and he had a 75-member CSA, and he was talking about doubling his CSA, and I said, well, how are you going to do that? And, you know, are you gonna, what's your advertising plan? And he just looked at me, and he's like, there are a million people next door. <laughs> He's like, it's just like taking candy from a baby, uh, which I don't know if you've ever tried that because it's really hard. Uh, but uh, people, but the we like to say uh, about about being in a rural area and um, growing our organic crops that somebody has to do it. <laughs> There's, somebody's got to to serve the the smaller markets, the rural markets. Um, but we definitely see a niche there. You know, I am the only certified organic grower and actually the only organic grower on a Saturday at the Hickory Farmers Market, at least um, at least until this year. Um, you know, so there's a, there's a niche there for doing what we do. Um, another thing that we feel like is that we are actually a, a very important part of our community. Um, our county is Wilkes County, and they did a this promotional video with these um, somewhat famous musicians, the Kruger Brothers, who live here. They did a, a Wilkes County promotional video, and Tumbling Trolls Farm is actually in that video. <laughs> it's our one second of fame. Um, but, you know, that we're actually a very important part of the community. Uh, People know us. We have relationships with our customers in this community. Um, and, you know, it's kind of easy to, to reach everybody in the community. We don't have to worry about people out there that we, that we haven't reached. Um, and I got to say, you know, it's, it's good for the ego to be a big fish in a small pond. <laughs> so we're a, we're a little tiny speck of a farm in the, in the grand scheme of farming, but, Everybody in 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 our immediate area knows who we are and and what we do, and so it's good for the ego. <laughs> yeah, we're we're in a community where if your picture is in the local newspaper, people actually notice that and they comment on it. Uh, Shiloh and I have been places, and we're we're transplants here. We're not from uh, Wilkes County, but we've been places and just had a. Uh, a waiter or a, a sales clerk say, hey, are you the people from Tumbling Shoals? Just because they've recognized us being out in public. So there's this small town celebrity that is is kind of a cool thing. I agree about the big, the big fish in a little pond. And, you know, when I was farming, we marketed up in the Twin Cities, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul in Minnesota. And we also marketed it in Rochester, Minnesota. And, you know, 
the Twin Cities being one of those infinite markets and, and Rochester being about 100,000 people at that time. And and it really was, you know, we were a big fish in the small pond in Rochester, and it was a very different experience to be up in the Twin Cities and marketing. People didn't know us as much up there, and and it was it was a good market for us, but it, it definitely had a different um, emotional reward. You know, one of the things, just as I was as I was looking around at at your farm on the internet, you guys have a really cool farmers market display. You you know you and and I wanted to, I mean, with sixty percent of your sales coming from farmer's market. I mean, that's that's a lot of the vegetables that you guys are moving. And you guys had set things up so your displays are very tall and, and narrow, um, at least what I saw online. Can you talk a little bit about how you actually achieve that look and, and why you went in that direction? So, so when we were out researching communities and farmer's markets, we were parked our car a couple blocks from the Blacksburg farmer's market and then, and then started walking towards the tents and things. And from about a block and a half away, we noticed a display and uh, that that's telling in that it was, it was standing out from the other displays so much. And so we walked right to that farm and started talking to them. And I, I wish I could give them credit. I don't even remember the names of the, farmers at this point, but they had a display stand built from old barn wood, and it was kind of a two-shelf system, which is is what we use at Farmer's Market. And uh, we knew immediately that we needed to to copy that because we're firm believers in, in stealing other people's good ideas as opposed to <laughs> innovating ideas. Innovators either are rich or broke, and, and we're just looking to make a living. So we uh, came home immediately and figured out how to copy that display uh, and uh, built some structures. They're, they're kind of heavy and a little bit tedious to set up. Uh, when I go to farmer's market by myself without, without any help, I've got to be the first one there in the morning setting up. But it's it's absolutely worth it. You know, starting back when we were in Durham, we noticed people who were on the other side of the market walking that they would notice our stand and then and then just come right over to us. And then after that, it's up to us to make make the sale. But the the display has paid for itself many times over. And it's worth the effort to set that up every week. I mean, that doesn't that's not a small thing when you add an extra fifteen minutes or a half an hour to your market day every week of the market year. Yeah, it's it's setting up and taking down. Uh, so, you know, that really right now it's that time investment that uh, is the difference. Uh, the, the initial investment in the materials is really pretty small once you divide it out over the number of seasons that we've used the market stands. But uh, it... It matters for sales. People look at us and they think, well, there is someone who has a professional operation. Their food must be good because it, it looks good here. Uh, and people eat with their eyes as much as they uh, eat with their mouths. And, and the experience that they have in purchasing the food has a lot to do with the experience they have when they're eating it. And and so we're trying to to build on that and and tie into that and get them to have a good experience right from the start. Well, I spent a number of years working in the grocery business, um, co-op groceries uh, in the in the produce departments, and I learned a whole lot about um, how display uh, works on. I hate to sound like this, but like the psychology of the shopper and, and you got to draw them in. And, you know, if you just look like everybody else in the farmer's market, uh, then, you know, what is it that's drawing the, those customers to your booth? So, you know, the old adage is the pilot high, kiss it goodbye. Our display really works in, on those principles. Um, the use of color and the vertical striping. And we just, you know, we learned from the, I had, I had wonderful teachers in the grocery business and, uh, learned that much about display and then of course we saw you know we were that drew our eye that display in Blacksburg from a block and a half away and so emulating that I would say it has uh, always rewarded us ever since we started doing it 
we we talk a lot about uh, Durham, this, we, we had what we call a practice farm, um, while we were working and taking classes at central Carolina, um, and working for other farmers. Uh, we had, I was working for this farmer, um, John Toner and he, he, uh, said, asked us, Oh, you know, this neighbor of mine wants me to farm this acre behind his house. Why don't y'all do it? He's been bugging me for years. And so he really got us set up. It was turned out it was a half acre and it used to be their garden. Um, and John let me borrow his equipment, and I would drive it down the road, um, and we farmed this little half acre, and we called that our practice farm, and that's uh, where we were selling in Durham. We sold a, a number of, of local markets in that area, the, the Chapel Hill area, um, but we started out, uh, our first, very first farmer's market that we ever went to, we started out with a, a card table and no tablecloth and no signs and like six bags of muddy lettuce. Um, and then just like a couple years later, we were selling in Durham and we had built that display that we copied from the Blacksburg farmers. And, uh, you know, we, we won an award for the most attractive display. And I mean, that's not, that's not paying off monetarily necessarily an award from the farmer's market, but, uh, we, it is, it is evidence that we are, are drawing the eye of the customer. If we're drawing the eye of the farmer's market in general, I think we're probably drawing the eye of the customer. Um, you got to back that up with uh, quality produce, but I, we definitely believe that um, display has uh, investment in display, and that's a time investment really, uh, has always uh, paid off for us. What else besides the display are you guys doing to enhance your customers' market experience? So there are, there are basic customer service things uh, like gre- interacting with the customers and, and greeting them as they come by, which is it's not natural for me. I'm an introvert, and so uh, my inclination would be to to stand back behind the stand and scowl, but uh, I know that if I force myself to come out front and just say good morning or hello or whatever it is that uh, that's going to make that person feel more comfortable and and willing to walk in. Uh, And it's interesting teaching employees that because some of them come to us with great customer service experience and, and some of them don't, but we, we kind of coach them through the farmer's market experience early in the seasons and, uh, help them to, to understand that interaction. And then the, the other thing we do a lot of is cook. Uh, I, I cook dinner every night. I consider it part of my job at the farm to, to use the produce that we grow. And so we are able to help people understand how to use the produce we grow, which I think is, is something really valuable that, that people appreciate instead of uh, growing radicchio and just saying, I don't know, it's bitter, uh, being able to help someone understand how they might prepare it, that, that they could enjoy it. So I'm a, I'm a very social person, so it does come naturally to me, but, but this is a really, a, I'm going to call it a benefit of being in a small community. And uh, it really is much easier to build these relationships. So I've been going to this market for, I'm, I'm going into my 10th year. So this is, I've been there for nine years. I know these people, I know their names, I know their kids, you know, I know where they went on vacation. I know, you know, and so it's just a relationship. So it's just like when a friend comes, uh, you'll ask them about, you know, their kids or uh, their vacation or uh, their health situation or, or, you know, you know, things about them just because you talk to them once or twice a week uh, for 30 weeks or whatever the season is. Um, and so, uh, it is much easier because you have a smaller customer count, um, to really, truly build relationships with your customers. And I think that's a, a enhancement of, a uh, customer's experience is they know you, you know them, uh, they're, I don't know, it's like a friendship. Shiloh has a notebook that she takes to farmer's market and every once in a while I'll get a glance in there and there'll be things written in there like the redhead with the brown bag's name is Carol and she has two children away at college and things like that that she just writes down to refresh her memory or to to just uh, 
you know, be able to glance back at that so that she knows who people are. She's very intentional about that part of it. You're giving away my magic secret. <laughs> yeah, that is good. You mentioned earlier, uh, Jason, you guys are just wanting to make a living on your farm. Are you guys making a living from the farm? Yeah, we haven't. Uh, I left my off-farm job in 2010, and we haven't had any other income besides the farm since 2010. So that's that's making a living. Of course, we are always uh, planning on how to do better. Uh, but uh, we we live a, a fine lifestyle uh, on the farm. We're we're satisfied with it. The things we think about now are how to prepare for retirement and health insurance changes and those sorts of things and, and how the farm needs to, to step up and, and cover those things as well. So this is, this is really part of our, our big transition heading into year 10. We uh, wrote a bit, we're big planners um, and we wrote this business plan and, you know, we, did that and we achieved those income goals and we've kind of plateaued at year nine. And so now we're like, okay, we are changing our focus. We're getting older and we're changing our focus to thinking about these things and um, retirement might require uh, a little, putting a little more money away. Um, Maybe as we age, uh, we would like some, uh, better standard of, not that we have, we have a fine standard of living, you know, we really do, but, you know, maybe we want to travel some. um, And so we're looking toward the future, like, okay, well, maybe it's time for uh, the farm managers to make a little more money. Um, And so that's been part of our big planning, transitional planning process. We looked at uh, whether it was the smart decision was to contract and reduce labor and reduce our paid labor and reduce our expenses and uh, grow less, which, you know, definitely fits in our, in our current market or to expand. And by expansion, I don't mean in terms of acreage. I mean, in terms of uh, investing in more labor and, and more and better infrastructure. Um, And we just spent some weeks of pretty intense, business planning meetings. We basically wrote two new business plans for the for the upcoming five to ten years where we expand and we contract. And uh the the big reveal as we, as we like to call it is that we chose expansion um because uh in the grand scheme of things we see more income potential in the expansion expansion. Again, it's more, it's investment in labor uh, and infrastructure. And we just saw a lot more potential for, in. it wasn't super clear cut, but um, the, the contraction model had these farm managers doing a lot more of the, uh, the farm labor, you know, the, the, in the weeds, farm labor, um, and one of our weaknesses as managers has been that we've been spending way too much time uh, in the weeds with the crew, so to speak, leading from the front, which can be beneficial, but we, it's been taking away from time to spend on like whole farm management. Um, and so the contraction model definitely had us spending more, a higher percentage of the, I'm going to call it manual labor. That sounds terrible, but um, the regular everyday weed the carrots, uh, you know, hoe the the lettuce, whatever, um, transplanting and not, uh, not adding any more time for us to do, to uh, do a better job at our marketing, um, really be uh, walking the fields and looking at the crop needs and doing proper analysis, sending disease samples, sending tissue samples, uh, researching pest life cycles, for example. Like that, that's what I call, I'm calling the whole farm management where um, you are doing some crew management, but you're also managing this, this farm as a whole, the whole ecosystem. And uh, the expansion and investing in more labor I'm going to say freeze up a little more time for us 
to uh, step back and look at the whole farm and maybe be doing some of these things that we haven't been spending enough time managing. One of the big things for us is water control. I invested in a tensiometer, I don't know, in 2009, and it flooded in 2009, so it wasn't super useful. But, uh, we, you know, I don't think I've used it since because I'm, I just haven't been spending, I've been spending the time in with my head down with the crew, harvesting crops, transplanting crops, taking care of crops, instead of letting the crew uh, run that part of the farm while I step back and, and manage water. I, I heard on one of your podcasts, someone like quadrupled their green bean yield just by managing water. And that was very inspiring to me to really figure out how to get that time as a farm manager rather than a, as a farm laborer. And, and when we look at the the problems we've had in our career farming, uh, we definitely see how, uh, having more time to manage to make decisions would have enabled us to head off some of those things. So when we have a crop failure, uh, we can look back and say, oh, if we had only done this at this time instead of having been uh, working with the crew, then then we could have fixed it. Uh, and that's been an, an evolution in our abilities as farmers. So when we started at Tumley Schultz Farm, our first season growing here was 2008. Uh, we we had some good business skills, but really uh, we were lacking in a lot of the production skills. And uh, there have been a couple things that have happened that have been eye openers, just watershed moments. Uh, at one point, we were, and Shiloh and I disagree where we heard this, but uh, we were reading something that you had written that said, good farmers do not have crop failures. And that was, that really made us think about things differently because we were very accepting of crop failures. We had uh, uh, our farming mantra was, you know, uh, we'll win some, we'll lose some. And the whole idea that, that you don't lose any at all was a new concept to us. And that made us think about how we were uh, looking at the farm differently. And around the same time, uh, we were hearing things about like JM 40 a and his, his high gross, high net operation. And uh per unit area and really looking at the differences in that and, and what we were doing and, and seeing that, you know, perfect weed control is, is not an option. It is, it is absolutely necessary to uh, make a living on very small scale acreage the way we were doing. And I, I think I'd read an agronomic textbook somewhere that a hundred percent weed control is an aesthetic choice, not an economic choice. And, and we had based our farming strategy on, on that idea. But as it turns out, that might be true in a cornfield, but it's, it's not true in a small-scale vegetable operation. But, but getting that – perfect is the wrong word – but getting as, as close as you can to having complete control over those weeds is a, uh, important to the bottom line. And those were things that early on we weren't doing, and we've – evolved to realize that we were doing, but also that we needed to do, evolved to realize that we needed to do, but also recognize that uh, that means that we're making the right decisions at the right time, which takes time to, to do for the management. Yeah, so we like to say we uh, we started out as firefighters or triage nurses and, and we're evolving into farm managers. Um, because that's what it needed to be a it needed to be a full fledged fire to get our attention um as when we were beginning uh well that crop we're about to lose to weeds, we better get in there instead of staying ahead of it with proper planning and like Jason said that it takes time to actively intentionally manage uh and so that's where our transition is leading us we're going we're we're working on being active intentional managers. Um, instead of firefighters. Well, and of course, the funny thing about being an active and intentional manager, you use like that, that weed control example. 
when you're actively and intentionally managing, you go out there and you look and you say, oh, I've got I've got a field full of just germinated weeds and you get somebody out there and you get it cleaned up and it takes a little bit of effort. But when you're in firefighting mode, it takes a lot more effort because instead of getting them when they're a half inch tall, you're getting things when they're four inches tall or a foot tall. And then it takes real effort to get those things under control. And so it's it's almost yeah, it's you, an, it's an interesting dynamic there when you when you look at doing that management work and breaking yourself away you go oh well, I got to put more energy into management but ideally that means that there's less energy going into the technical work our models were Alex and Betsy hit at Peregrine Farm who do a great job of that management so well that you don't even notice that they're doing it. And so when we were learning to farm and, and watching their operation, we didn't really realize how good they were at making those decisions and doing things at the right time. Uh, all we saw was, oh, they take Tuesday afternoons off. And if it's a, <laughs> a hot day, they have, yeah, if it's a hot day, they're, uh, in the shade doing something because they they planned for that and they they know how to make that happen. They they were quitting at the time Shiloh was working for them. They were quitting farming for the year uh, around the first of October, uh, and all those things really appealed to us. Having uh, the free time and uh, the time off in the winter seemed like a very important thing, but we didn't realize. Uh, how very good they actually were at making the decisions that, that allowed them to that. And so for our first few years, we were just running around everywhere, uh, working all the time in the uh, summer. And even though we are taking winters off ostensibly, we had a, a huge backlog of projects that needed to get done more than we could possibly accomplish in the, in the off season. And so it, it's been a learning experience to, to get to a point where we, uh, uh, can actually have the lifestyle that that we set out to have. And I think that's probably true of, of any small farm or any business uh, where the owners enter the business as a technician. Um, I mean, I know even in my podcasting world that it's been like that. I mean, it's been a couple of years of of scrambling to stay on top of episodes and and just now kind of getting to the point where where hopefully if, if things go right and kind of like your guys is planning where I'm able to, to still engage in the technical work, but kind of get off the get off the hamster wheel. Um, but I think it does take some time to just to even prove out that the 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 doing that management work, doing that working on the business instead of in the business part is actually going to be worth doing. Yeah, and, and models are really important for that. I, I really appreciate the people who are out there sharing their numbers and uh, saying that it's possible because you can you can easily come to believe that how you're doing it something is as as well as it can be done until you see someone doing it better, and then you can say, oh, there's there's room for improvement. And what is it that I'm doing? You can do the self analysis at that point to uh, figure out what it is that, that you're doing that, that could be better. And with that, we're going to stop, take a break, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back with Jason Rorig and Shiloh Avery from Tumbling Shoals Farm in Millers Creek, North Carolina. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by Farm Commons. I had a great attorney while I was farming, but in a town surrounded by a sea of corn and soybeans, he often didn't understand the ins and outs of what we were up to on a legal front, whether it was dealing with intern housing, in-kind wages, land leases for my market farm, or putting my CSA on a strong legal footing. Farm Commons gets it. And what's more, Farm Commons turns that understanding into practical, accessible, and easy-to-understand resources that put the law into plain language without oversimplifying things. And did I say that they were free? Even my great attorney didn't do that. With an ever-growing selection of free guides, model documents, and video tutorials, Farm Commons understands that a strong, resilient farm business is built on a solid legal foundation. Visit the Farm Commons website or watch for their interactive workshops held around the country. Farmcommons.org. And by Small Farm Central. 
providers of Member Assembler CSA management software. Member Assembler makes it easy for CSA members to sign up and for you to manage the process, all in a flexible, easy to customize format. And once you have your members signed up, Member Assembler gives you better ways to get your CSA information to your staff, including customizable pickup lists, box building tools, and calculated harvest lists. It makes it easy for CSA members to update their shares and request vacation holds and provides a platform for segmented and scheduled email messaging. Plus, Member Assembler's auto rollover tool has been shown to increase retention by 6 to 7% on its own, a feature that can be worth hundreds of dollars per member in lifetime value. Member Assembler helps you spend less time in the office and more time doing what you do best. Farming. Smallfarmcentral.com. And we're back with Shiloh Avery and Jason Rorig from Tumbling Shoals Farm in Millers Creek, North Carolina. Jason, right before we went on break, you were... You were saying how important it's been that that people have been willing to share their model and share their numbers. So I'm going to turn that back on you and say, you know, tell us a little bit about your numbers. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to, uh, and uh, I I don't set us up as an example for uh, other people necessarily, but uh, I feel pleased with where we've gotten in the amount of time that we have. We're we're grossing on the little less than three acres uh, this season, somewhere between 160 and 165 brand. Uh, I know it's almost December 31st, and I should have that number pinned down exactly, but uh, <laughs> I still don't quite have all the things added up. And the net on that acreage uh, this season is about 45,000. Uh, and that's what Shiloh and I are taking home to to live off of and uh that's about where we projected in our original business plan that we would be uh but we were 27 years old when we were writing that original business plan recently returned from uh being peace corps volunteers where i had literally lived on you hear people in the advertisements talk about living on a dollar per day i literally lived on a dollar per day it was actually plenty of money there for me as a as a Peace Corps volunteer in Madagascar. So our perception of need was a, a little different than I think most people who are uh, approaching a business career. However, as we've gotten older, uh, we've uh, realized that, that some of the creature comforts that are here and available to us are, are things that we would uh, really enjoy. And so we're we're targeting as we've we've rewritten our uh, cash flow projections or, or redone our business planning. The we're we're really shooting to make about seventy thousand net. And Shiloh mentioned that we were looking at two different ways to get there. One was contracting and reducing expenses, and the the other is investing more in labor and infrastructure to to get us to that point. And yeah, we've we've gone over that, but uh, that's the ultimate goal is to get to that seventy grand net, and and we think we'll be there in a couple of years. That's the idea with two thousand seventeen. By two thousand eighteen or two thousand nineteen, we we expect to be at that point. So when you talk about about improving from forty five thousand dollars net to seventy or seventy five thousand dollars net, what do you think that's going to require in terms of changes to your gross sales? So that's a that's a good question. Uh, we so some of it is just uh, pruning, which is getting rid of those crops that aren't giving the uh, aren't aren't yielding the the growth that we need. So we have a, our, our farm is divided, the, the outside production is divided into 12, 90 by 100 foot fields. And our crop rotation rotates through those 12 units. All our beds are 90 feet long, 32 inches wide. And uh, when we started, we thought if we make $250 per bed, that's what we need to do. Well, we've adjusted that number, and really what we're shooting for right now is more like $500 per bed, and that means that, that some of the crops that aren't quite getting us there are, are going to have to go away, uh, and it means that some of the crops that aren't quite getting there 
we we need to do some research and, and improve how we're doing the production or or raise the prices. Those are really the two strategies that we use to uh, increase the income. And that should get us to a gross something slightly below 200000 uh, And uh, we think that's attainable with the existing markets. Uh, we think that we can accomplish that as producers. And we uh, feel like we'll have the labor force to actually move all that produce around and, and get it off the farm and sold. So you've actually got six 30 by 66 high tunnels on. You've got the you've got the hay grove tunnels, which you move around the farm. Um, and I, I want to come back and just ask you a little bit more about those in a couple of minutes. But where are you looking at investing in additional infrastructure to because you're talking about not only increasing your gross, but also increasing your margin as as you grow your overall uh, sales? Yeah, that's that's I, we've just been working a lot of numbers on those, so it's a, uh, it's a timely question. So one of the things that we're planning on doing is investing in some heated space. So in addition to those unheated high tunnels that I talked about, we're uh, right now looking at putting in a roughly thirty by a hundred, maybe a little bit longer than a hundred feet, because we we have probably one hundred and twenty feet that we could fill. Uh, heated greenhouse and from what we can tell the the if you do two crops of tomatoes in that space in a year a, a very early season and a late season crop of tomatoes uh that margin is is way better than what we've been doing in the field and then also in the field the the way that we'll be increasing margin is is that uh, pruning out of the the lower margin crops. Uh, the major improvement that we are planning for the, the outside production, the, the field production, is uh, looking at equipment for handling compost. We don't we don't currently use any compost on the farm and being more intentional in our cover cropping. Uh, here in the South, we have really four full seasons of growth that we can get. As I'm standing here right now, I'm looking out at the fields and I can see my cover crops growing out there just beautifully. It's dark green rye and slightly uh, less green oats out there with the uh, crimson clover uh, in the understory. Can't quite see it yet. But uh, the investment in labor, it's sometimes historically we have missed a cover crop where there's a crop coming out of the field. The, the field's finished in June and we have time to do a summer cover before we plant our, our fall and winter cover. And we just, we get too busy and we miss that cover crop. And so it, it either stays, the, the crop doesn't necessarily get disked in or the uh, crop gets disked in, but we just, leave it fallow for the summer and don't get the cover crop in by having the additional labor here that should allow us to, to get those jobs done, improve our soil health, for, so soil fertility, which is going to help us move those crops that right now are like 450 per bed to that 500 per bed number where, where we need them to be. When you talk about labor on the farm, um, how many people do you have working for you? So last year we had between four and five people. And the reason that number is between four and five is um, we had some flux. Some people come early and leave. Uh, and we had a couple employees leave a little later in the season. Um, and so last year was uh, not a good example. However, we had only planned to have four last year. And at one point we had five and it was the most amazing thing ever. We were able to stay ahead of the game when we had five employees and it made us realize that for our scale in our production, five employees is, is actually the right number. And so in order to, to move uh, Jason and myself off the farm crew a little more and to do some of this in more intentional management, 
uh, we need those five people and we need to do a, a really good intentional training um, with that crew. So now our goal for um, our crew this year, this is a symptom of growing in the South too. So we have a longer growing season uh, than farmers in, in New York, for example, uh, at least in the field. Um, and it's really hot <laughs> and it's really humid. And, uh, so one of these, one of the a thing that happens, uh, here is sometime in August, we call it, we get a crew die off. Um, and some of that is, uh, people just not being able to take it and they leave or, uh, we're all, including, uh, the managers are all moving, uh, a lot slower. We're getting a lot less done in the same amount of hours. Um, we're pretty strict. We only work eight hour days. Um, well, at least the crew only works eight hour days and we try to stick to that as well. Um, but so this year, uh, we're trying to have the crew by August ready to run the farm without us and what's going to happen in August. This is part of our intention and they're going to know that goal. So uh, we're all going to work together toward that goal. And then when we get to August, everybody in staggered uh, time frames are going to get a uh, paid vacation um, of at least uh, three days plus the weekend. So hopefully someone can take a break, go someplace else for five days. And so that'll be staggered. And then when everybody, all the crew is back from their paid vacation, that Jason and Shiloh get to take a, a vacation for a few days anyway. Um, so that we all, during that crew, crew die off in August, we all get to renew and rejuvenate and uh, feel rested. And so we can come back because our energy level is pretty low um, in the fall and, in the fall season, which we have here, we have a whole giant fall season that we can grow here in the warm, humid south. Uh, the Our energy level is so low, and our, our typically our fall seasons have not been superb. <laughs> uh, we're not we're not quite on it, um, and we recognize that a very very large part of that is our energy level, and that that energy level just seeps down into the crew and we're all just tired and worn out, uh, for the fall season. And so we're not at, we're not performing. And so, uh, we're trying to, this year where, where our goal is to really prevent crew die off, uh, in August by giving, providing that vacation, uh, and that rejuvenation at a time when, when they need it the most. And then the goal is for them to be able to run the farm so we can leave for probably three days. Yeah. It, Shiloh was, 25 years old when she was working for Alex and Betsy and they gave her Alex and Betsy at Peregrine Farm gave her their her first paid vacation ever which at the time we just thought was the coolest thing in the world what a what a great perk as a an employee to get a paid vacation uh but now we recognize the enlightened self-interest in that decision where they had someone coming back for the fall who had a lot of energy, who was uh, feeling really positively about the farm. And so we're, we're adopting that strategy. Uh, we haven't really, we've interviewed a few people for positions already this season, but we haven't really advertised that fact that we're doing paid vacation. So uh, maybe people will hear the podcast and, and we'll get a lot of, uh, a lot of people interested in that. Right. That's, that's tumbling shoals farm.com, right? You got it. Okay. So there, there you go, folks. Um, tell me about your hay groves. Uh, and, and I think there's probably a lot of people out there who know when I say hay grove, what I'm talking about. Uh, and I think there's probably a lot of people that are, that are scratching their heads. So if you could start at the very basic level of like, what is a hay grove? And then how are you using that in your operation? So it's, it's a high tunnel and it's a hay grove is a, a company of uh, high tunnel manufacturers that started in England specifically with the purpose of keeping rainwater off of strawberries so that they could go grow uh, strawberries in that gray, humid uh, UK environment. And we uh, decided to have 
the structures on the farm to keep rainwater off of tomatoes because in the south growing tomatoes outside at least ripe tomatoes is is a very questionable enterprise because uh, we have so many tomato diseases but basically they are our structure is 90 by 100 and and they will build them to fill any amount of space that you want uh they'll so happily manufacture them to, to fit your specifications. Uh, we have four 24 foot bays that are uh, connected. There are five lines of posts that get screwed into the ground. So this is different than our Atlas high tunnels, for example, that just have straight pipes. These actually have a, a screw bit on the bottom of the post and they uh, screw into the ground and then they, the top of that post is a Y-shaped uh, pipe that the bows attach to. So uh, these four bays of high tunnels are uh, sharing three legs of posts, and then the, the two outside legs of posts just have the, the one set of hoops attached to them. And the, they're a little simpler than our other high tunnels as in terms of the amount of hardware that goes into them, uh, these are these are just uh, bows, and the the three sets of hoops on each end of each high tunnel bay is uh, well braced with uh, all, all the different kinds of supports that go in there to to uh, make those three hoops at the end of the they uh, sturdy and then the other sets of hoops the whole way down the line of the bay are just connected with some high tensile wire uh, which I, I find really clever so the those hoops are essentially just standing on the leg post sticking up in the air and then there's a strand of high tensile wire that runs down the middle of the top to keep those bows from swaying back and forth but uh, they're they're really not uh, supporting a lot of weight in the uh, sideways direction and the plastic goes on top of that and the the thing that's really cool about it is with our atlas high tunnels there is a wiggle wire track down the sidewalls these use crisscross ropes over the top of the uh, hay growth structure to hold the plastic on top of it and all that stuff goes up and comes down really pretty easily it takes us uh, well, we have the number somewhere, but a few days with a crew to tear it down, uh, move it to another location and put it back up. And we're, we're doing it just for tunnels or excuse me. We are doing it just for tomatoes. Uh, the, uh, structure gets rotated around those 12 units of the farm, the 1290 by hundred units and uh, just just moves right along with a regular crop rotation. And it's it's not a season extension tool for us. Uh, it is a climate altering tool. We looked at um, some pretty rough tomato production years out in the field versus in the in the high tunnel, um, and we thought, well, we can either move to California or we can make the plants believe they're in California, which is not totally true because we still have humidity, but um, keeping the rain off tomatoes uh, in this super... So we struggle with uh, too much water, more than not enough water um, in the Southeast. And so this, the only, we, I call it the tomato umbrella. The only job of this structure is to keep the rain off the tomatoes, off the leaves, um, to, for disease prevention, to keep us from uh, losing tomato crops to disease. Disease is, is our biggest challenge of farming in the Southeast. Jason and I both read the John Jeevan's uh, How to Grow More Vegetables on So Little Land, or I can't remember the title, but um, this biointensive, you know, really close spacing, using like all surfaces of the bed. And we both gardened that way prior to our farming career. Uh, but every year uh, we actually get 
uh, bio disintensive. <laughs> we're, we're widening our spacing because um, disease is such a problem and that close spacing uh, in the hot, humid, wet environment is really just, you know, a disease paradise. So every year we increase our spacing on things um, and grow fewer plants and, and consequently get higher yields. Yeah. Do you remember, Shiloh, the yield increase from the tomatoes from the, the last year of outside production to the first year of inside? Yes, it was fivefold. Yeah, so we uh, switched from outdoor production on our tomatoes. Uh, we had 24 beds in that 90 by 100 foot field, and we put them under the hay grove canopy, 16 beds, and our yields were five times the the number of pounds of tomatoes in the area uh, with fewer plants. Yeah. And the same thing happened with strawberries. We have strawberries. We don't feel like we can sell retail price uh, a whole hay grow, which is it, it, ours is roughly a quarter acre um, worth of strawberries. So we put them in a, a, a high tunnel, which is uh, 66 by 30 feet. Um, and the same thing happened. Uh, the We had them out in the field in 2009, which isn't fully really fair because 2009 was a complete flood disaster, but uh, we moved them and that was 3,000 plants out in the field and in week two of harvesting uh, from 900 plants in the hoop house, we surpassed the yield uh, out in the field. So the same thing happened, uh, by, and again, that's just keeping the rain off them. Those super wimpy plants like tomatoes and strawberries. You mentioned how important quality is as a marketing niche for you guys at Farmer's Market. What else are you doing besides keeping the rain off, controlling the disease, uh, to ensure that you've got quality produce? <laughs> In a lot of ways. <laughs> I hope our customers don't listen because they're, they're generally horrified by how uh, much we throw away um, of uh specifically crops that are you know really disease susceptible um we grow a lot of sweet peppers um ripe sweet peppers and the edges of and those are grown outside um probably someday we will have those in a hay grove too um but uh right now they're grown outside and the the edges of our fields are very colorful <laughs> Uh, nice. We do. We we try to call very very hard, um, and we try to do that out in the field. We don't need to be paying people to be hauling rejects in. Um, so we try to call heavy in the field, and then we call again in the pack shed. Okay. And we've got uh, a pr for the the things like kale and collards, the the greens. We've got got a pretty good system of moving from the field into the hydro cooling and then rapidly into the walk-in cooler. Uh, and that certainly helps with, with those products that can, that can be wilted or whatever. We also try, uh, with, you know, we can push the seasons a little bit, you know, to get a little earlier, a little bit later, but we don't try to grow things out of their season. One thing I noticed about, um, all these farmers in the north who, who coincidentally are the ones who have the time to write the books, <laughs> right. <laughs> is, uh, you know, they're, they're growing lettuce year round. Um, uh, and that is, a, that is not a crop or at least all, all summer season long. That is lettuce is just not a crop that is going to thrive in July and August here. In fact, um, our quality, we, we just don't even try it um, in July and August. There's no lettuce coming off this farm in July and August. The quality, uh, it is way too hot for that cool season crop. We also don't grow kale and collards. We struggle with getting any kind of summer green um, during July and August because it's just too hot and humid for those crops to thrive. And then, you know, when they're not thriving, then you run into uh, insect pressure, disease pressure, and the quality suffers. So we, we, tried one year to grow lettuce out of the lettuce season in July with a shade cloth and misters. And it was, it tasted really okay, but it was really funny shaped and uh, really took away from our uh, main summer season crops like tomatoes. And so in, 
So we don't do that anymore. Instead, we we focus on, well, what thrives in the heat? Well, eggplant and okra and tomatoes uh, and peppers, those thrive in the heat. So we really, I mean, we have, we have five, we can do five successions of tomatoes here in the Southeast during, during the main season. Um, uh, so we, instead we, we just don't try to grow those things out of season. I know it defies our customers desire to have whatever they want, whenever they want. Um, but we're, we, you know, we have to do some, some education there probably. Uh, but yeah. And so Another strategy for quality control is growing within the the proper season. We do periodically lose CSA customers because they don't understand the the seasonality of the produce, but that's just that's just something that happens. I think that's true no matter where you're farming. Um, so, um, and tell me a little bit about your your outdoor production system. Um, are you guys, so with, with three acres of vegetables, are you guys operating on a tractor scale? Are you guys running uh, BCS two wheel tractors? Uh, how do you guys have that set up? Uh, we're using, um, we have one tractor on the farm and it's a Kubota L3400, uh, small scale, 34 horse, horsepower, four wheel drive, um, does not have a bucket. We use the tractor for all of the field preparation. So um, we pull a crop out, uh, we'll use the tractor to disc the crop residue in. Um, We're in a pretty sandy loam soil, so we do subsoil, but we don't do it every year. So it's probably more like every other year. It's not something I'm, I'm, I I do track it for organic certification, but I don't know that I look at it quite as often as I should when we subsoil. and then we uh, we do everything in raised beds. Uh, all our fields are uh, exactly the same dimension. They're they're thirty. I think it's thirty two. Thirty two inch wide beds um, by ninety feet long, and there are twenty four beds in every field. Um, and so that way we can move trellis material. Move. Uh, we use landscape fabric. We do not grow on black plastic. The benefits of growing on black plastic are very well documented. Um, but I once worked on a farm where I had to pull that stuff up at the end of the season. And it was absolutely the worst job that mankind has ever invented. And so, uh, we don't use black plastic. So to get the benefits without having that, that horror show at the end of the year, we grow on landscape fabric, which is, uh, more expensive upfront to invest in, um, but it's uh, we reuse it. So uh, we have some ten-year-old plastic, probably on the or not plastic ten-year-old. We have some ten-year-old landscape fabric on the farm. Um, it is much easier to pull up, even if weeds have crept in over the edges. You can yank on it; it's sturdy, um, and we reuse it. Um, so. The tractor is used um, to raise up those beds, and that's just with a, a better that's, that you know throws the soil up kind of in a windrow look. And then we come um, through behind that with a rototiller, which squares off the bed. Uh, and then we lay the landscape fabric by hand. Um, we most of our fields in the landscape fabric we use um, straw in the aisles between the landscape fabric. Um, we've recently moved to just wider fabric, like in tomatoes and, and the hay grow. Um, so there's actually no straw in there. It's just wider fabric. Um, same thing for strawberries in the tunnel. Uh, and most of our crops are, are grown on that system. The landscape fabric with straw, uh, with or without straw in the aisles. And then we do a couple fields of bare ground. So our lettuce is all grown on bare ground. Um, so once, and we hand transplant. Uh, we're using those uh, wind, those lovely, popular, sought-after wind strip um, greenhouse trays. We have a passive solar greenhouse, uh, and then we hand transplant uh, everything. I mean, we're oh, I should know the number of transplants, but you know, we're, we're a small farm uh, with 90-foot beds, and we're growing in these landscape fabrics. So this is what makes the most sense for us. Uh, it's not the not the easiest on our back, but you get a five person crew on it and uh, we can whip that out pretty quickly. Um, but once the landscape fabric is down, everything is, is 
manual labor. Uh, we try to avoid most hand pulling of weeds, but um, it would be a, a person with a hoe. Uh, we do some tractor aisle cultivation and, and those bare ground beds, the lettuce um, and beets and carrots, uh, the, you know, the direct seeded things. Those are also on bare ground. Still in those 90 foot beds, 32 inch wide, but they're, uh, those are, it's just a few fields really that are still on bare ground because as we've moved toward eliminating weeds on the farm from uh, firefighting, uh, we've learned that uh, the investment in landscape fabric is really uh, the, uh, I'm going to call it a panacea. (laughs) It's not because there's some labor there, um, but it's really been a a huge problem solver, solver for us to prevent the weeds rather than try to stay on top of them. Yeah, especially for long season crops like the tomatoes and peppers. And with that, it's time for us to turn to our lightning round. First, we're going to get a quick word from a sponsor, and then we'll be right back. Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. In the wild, where our crop plants' ancestors evolved their microbial partnerships, plants are provided with nutrients from the soil through the work of partner microbes in their employ. Wide-ranging roots reach an abundant supply of nutrients and microbes, even in less than ideal conditions. And now that you've gone and stuck that seed in a little tiny container, it has to get everything it needs right there in a few cubic centimeters of soil. By providing compost-based potting soils built on ingredients selected to create an environment that supports the growth of plants, chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients, Vermont Compost ensures that your plants have what they need consistently. Makers of living media for organic growers since 1992. VermontCompost.com. And we're back with Jason Rorig and Shiloh Avery. We're going to do the the lightning round here at the end of the show. Uh, Shiloh, what's your favorite tool on the farm? My favorite tool on the farm? Uh, the smartphone. Really? Which is new new for us in the, in the last couple of years. Um, yeah. It's, it's been, uh, yeah, because... Well, I, I, there's just a lot of things where, you know, you're writing it down and then you're, you're having to try to remember to look back at that. Uh, we have a crop problem in the field. We can take a picture right there and email it to our extension agent. Um, you know, we, we try to do record keeping on there, uh, which is pretty immediate and, and will eliminate what happens up until we had smartphones was hopefully things got written down. And then I, in the winter, took all that writing and put it into, we managed the farm with the database, uh, the an access database management program, and I would put it all into there and we're eliminating that uh, office labor step with the smartphone. But there's just this immediate, you can look things up just right there. Uh, it's pretty revolutionary for us. And And that access database that you're using for managing the farm, is that something you guys built yourselves? It is, uh, and access is not necessarily intuitive. Uh, since we we did that, um, and you know, I, there was a lot of I don't know about blood, but definitely tears <laughs> in developing it. And it's not perfect, but since we've done that, there are management programs out there that I can't attest to because we built this one and we use it. So I haven't actually really in depth checked out. I know the egg squared guys came and talked to me for a long time on the farm. And I feel like that's probably uh, developed into a really nice system. But again, I actually haven't used it. So it would, it would be nice for somebody who has used it to, to uh, tell people about it. Yeah. That, that database has been incredibly valuable for us to be able to actually use the numbers that we're keeping track of. So we can look at any bed at the farm anytime during the season in that database and see not only just what we planted, when we planted, how it was fertilized, but also how much we've harvested, how much of that we've sold, how much money we've made on that bed. So the the database, uh, as compared to a spreadsheet, like an Excel spreadsheet, makes it really easy to, to use the information. The information flow is really nice. Jason, you said that you guys are firm believers in stealing other people's good ideas. What's the best idea that you've stolen? Oh, my goodness. Uh, 
Well, the the hay grove, the tomato structure, we uh, stole from our mentors, Alex and Betsy, hit, and, and that has worked really well for, for us. We talked about the uh, farmer's market stand. That was a good one. Uh, you know, uh, I'm sure that there are some individual crops that we've stolen and started growing. Uh, they're not jumping out to me right now. Shiloh, do you have any? Oh, I think the landscape fabric idea, which we also stole from Alex and Betsy. <laughs> yeah. All, yeah. It's always good to have somebody who's a fertile source of ideas. Oh. Yeah. And so our our local foods community is, <laughs> is a little bit behind in its development of where the central North Carolina local foods community is. So we can we can always readily go there and just ask, oh, what's new? What are the chefs interested in? And be a year or two ahead of, of what's happening here. It's it's really a, a good advantage for us. Shiloh, what's your favorite crop to grow? Oh, all right. well, my favorite crop to eat is peppers. So uh, I like the pepper crop. We, we noticed this, or I noticed this funny thing about my favorite crops to eat maybe get an inordinate amount of space on the farm. <laughs> <laughs> we grow a lot of sweet peppers. They've expanded like outside of their one field. We're growing more of those. Um, and my favorite variety of tomato maybe gets an inordinate amount of space. Uh, but pepper is my favorite crop to eat. Uh, also, we grow this, we've been growing this ahi dulce pepper for 10 years. It's like a habanero without the heat. And uh, recently, a uh, uh, distillery picked up this pepper and they're putting it in a vodka. And so that's a really cool thing to grow because it's a really neat product that they're making. Um, and it's kind of just fun to do cross marketing of this little pepper that we grow. Yeah. It's called flying pepper vodka by fair game distillery. And uh, you probably have to come to North Carolina to get it, but look for it while you're here. Awesome. Jason, what's your favorite crop to grow? Uh, I I would second Shiloh on the peppers. They're just so varied and beautiful and delicious. And we have just a, a beautiful pepper display at Farmer's Market. It is abundant and uh, colorful. And, and so I'm right there with her. And the, the chilies are exciting. Uh, we always add some, some new chilies every season and uh, we that's we become known for that, and uh, so uh, that's definitely a good one. It's also a very yeah, difficult crop to pro- produce, and we do it well. So uh, it's it's given us this. Uh, mar- we're filling a market niche, and we are uh, building a reputation for ourselves. For ourselves, when I show back up at Farmers Market first of May, uh, I will have customers come up and ask me when the peppers will be ready, uh, which here doesn't happen until first uh, of August. So they're thinking about them all winter. Speaking of the best idea that we ever stole from Alex, <laughs> that pepper roaster is a pretty good idea. Which oh, we take yeah, the the pepper roaster. T- yeah, we take the pepper roaster to mind. This is this comes directly from Alex, who stole it from uh, New Mexico, but that's fine. Uh, takes it to market, and during peak pepper season, will will people can buy peppers, and then you roast them for them right at market. So that scent, it's theater. There's this you know open flame roasting peppers, and the scent wafts, and it smells delicious. So that's really really popular. That was one of the better ideas that we stole from Alex. Jason, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? I've thought about this question, and there are really two things that I would tell myself. Uh, the The first is that uh, to aspire to more, that, that the income target that we set for ourselves, uh, we we could do better. And so to... to Aim for higher, I think, would be something. And the second, uh, we we really love where we live, and we uh, chose this spot with a, a lot of thought. Uh, but I would uh, consider looking at bigger markets for 
uh, our options because just the I think you referred to the Minneapolis St. Paul market as infinite. Uh, we we do not have infinite markets, so we're uh, going to one of those infinite markets might have made things easier to to begin with. And Shiloh, same question for you. If you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Uh, I I think um, we have a phrase we say a lot on the farm: "Know thyself." Uh, and by knowing thyself, being clear about your expectations, um, we have, we struggled for the first few years with, uh, uh, getting the right people working on the farm, um, and then really managing those people. And we found, uh, that just being very clear, we have written kind of expectations now being very clear about. You know, this is what you can expect from us. This is what we expect from you uh, has really gone a long way in, in people management. And so to avoid that goal early on, um, being clear about what you expect and what people can expect from you. Jason and Shiloh, thank you so much for being on the show today. Well, thank, thank you. We're honored to be here. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 102 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for tumbling. That's T-U-M-B-L-I-N-G. Transcripts for this episode are brought to you by Growing for Market. Get 20% off your subscription with the code podcast at checkout. And by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk-behind farming equipment and high-quality garden tools in North America. EarthTools.com. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast right in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, if you like the show, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review, or talk to us in the show notes. Tell your friends on Facebook. We're Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. I really couldn't do this show without them. You can support the show by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. <laughs>